hey, your background makes me happy and jealous. Yeah, well, sorry. Oh, look at those beautiful <laughs> yeah, trees. I am in the middle of nature, in the middle of the woods. So, um, yeah, this was the least backlit I could get. Uh, no, with, it's a beautiful. Still showing these these green things behind me. Um, yeah, it's 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 April. What are those things called again, Josh? I haven't seen one in some time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got their trees, um, but over here we have a white pine, um, and over on that side we have some spruce. There, I think there's something called Norwegian spruce. Um, this area is uh, the Upper Delaware River Basin, uh, which is the watershed for New York City, Philadelphia, and Southern New Jersey, altogether about 16 million people. And this is a place where the movement fought back against the fracking industry and beat them. So thankfully, we are not completely destroyed by oil and gas and preserving all that you see around here. So sometimes and, and in large, uh, you know, with large thanks to you and your actions around that as well. Well, thank um, you. But uh, yeah, it's really it, it takes everybody in this uh, community has, has pitched in and everyone came in with different kind of forms of, of, of participation. I would also thank them equally as much if they were yeah, here right now, sure. because <laughs> hopefully some of them are. We'll see. That's good. Okay, so let me do a, a full on like uh, intro because we're going to cut this and put it over on our YouTube page as well. But for anyone who's watching on Facebook, you might know that Josh already has uh, staying home with Josh Fox on that this very Act TV page in the evening. Um, it's so good. It's like hanging out with intelligent people with the same morals that you share in a fun, chill way. I can't say how much. I find how happy it I am that it's on Act TV and that you're there at night with me. Yeah, I thank you. I, I mean, to, to, it's it started just because I was supposed to be on tour, obviously, as everyone in the world was supposed to be on tour at this point. Um, got canceled, right? And uh, so I was doing these Green New Deal teach-ins for the DSA, for, for the Democratic Socialists of America and also for the Bernie campaign. So um, the DSA said, well, could you do an, another one and we'll just do it on the air? And I said, well, why don't I just do one every night? You know. So every night we talk about a different aspect of the Green New Deal. Now, that doesn't sound so super scintillating on the surface of it. But when you think about this massive policy shift, which is the Green New Deal, there are so many aspects of it, right? The Green New Deal is a feminist plan. The Green New Deal is anti-racist. The Green New Deal is about um, defeating white supremacy. The, the Green New Deal is about creating renewable energy, but also creating a value structure. So there's so much to talk about there. And we've had everything from you know Nobel Prize winners, who was on last night, to um, New Orleans musicians, um, to oh. great actors. It's, it's, it's really fun. So every night there's a, a policy discussion and then there's music because there's all these musicians that I know that are stuck indoors. And so we're giving them an opportunity to play. And it's, it's really the important. best show on television, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what you would want you can, if, you, you know, our corporate media like allowed the voices of the real people to be well, up. That's, <laughs> that's the fascinating thing about this moment is that we're actually able to kind of come back and, and fight back and create new things, right? Just because we're stuck in this, in this, in how, inside, <laughs> um, doesn't mean we can't make things, you know? I know, I was like yelling at, the, I'm like, oh, I have the same job as Rachel Maddow. Yeah. <laughs> I have the same job as Stephen Colbert. We're all like equal now. Yeah. And uh, I gotta say, Act TV kind of knows how to make things roll. And, well, and I'm not. really grateful because if we hadn't had Act TV step up and step in, we wouldn't have the, the technology and the audience and the understanding that how to make this happen. So it's really awesome. Uh, we have people commenting on what you've commented on already in our Twitch chat. Uh, Starry Knight says the Green New Deal is totally doable as demonstrated by the multi-trillion dollar spending we have just seen over the last few weeks. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Right. Uh, the, the big argument against all of these programs, social programs, which would help people, was that, well, we don't have the money. We don't have the money. We don't have the money. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? Even though it said quite clearly on Bernie's website how Bernie planned to pay for his and all these plans have a, a real clear way to pay for them. Um, yeah, all of a sudden, when Wall Street was in trouble, when the big banks were in trouble, you know, two trillion dollars materialized and was passed by the House, Senate, and the executive branch of this nation's government in the blink of an eye. And it included a yeah. Where did they get that money from? Is what I want to know. They've been sitting on the slush fund. Yeah, a five hundred billion dollar slush fund for for basically just goes straight into Trump's uh, and his fund friends' pockets. Ah. Um, 
Meanwhile, the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, which is the uh, thing that supports artists in America, got something like $72 million, uh, whereas the bankers got $500 billion. So think about all the artists in America. Which is so weird because the NEA is having such a hard time. You know, they're having a hard time supporting the arts. Obviously, no one can go outside. Every single artist. Meanwhile, I still got to pay my fucking rent. Excuse me. <laughs> the Blame bank me. is still getting the money. You know well, I've I mean? been, I've been, we've been talking a lot about how we need to have a rent freeze, um, uh, on both uh, in, in uh, on my show and in Twitter and all these places, just pushing this idea. We absolutely, I don't understand. See, look, I've been the thorn in Governor Cuomo's side for a very long time, right? Ah, yes. And a I lot of that this. very effectively because we we banned fracking in New York State, and we did that by assembling a movement of hundreds of thousands of people over a six-year period and got the science done and got into that administration and said, listen, and they actually did listen, which to their credit, they banned fracking, they banned the Constitution pipeline, they banned the NED pipeline, they stopped a whole slew of horrible fossil fuel projects. So Cuomo on the environment has been pretty great, actually. But on this, it's like, no, you can't say you're New York tough if then if you're making the toughest New Yorkers go out into the disease every day, which is what he's doing. The poorest New Yorkers still have to pay their rent. The poorest New Yorkers still have to do their job. I don't know how many people in New York City have like two, three, four months rent line, just lying around like, oh, uh, no, no wow, one, was, not one no person. One. No one. People who have that money are the landlords. They're not the oh, rent. Right. And even the small <laughs> landlords right now are, are saying, OK, well, sorry, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cut your rent in half or we'll, we'll accept three fifths payment. You know, that's that. You know, I, I just I, I New York hashtag New York tough. Right. How tough did it have to be to grow up the son of the governor? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Um, I, I was born in New York City. You know what I'm saying? I know what tough is. Tough is not let's make all the black people and all the poor people, all the diversity of New York go to work every day and spread the disease. Mm -hmm. You want to flatten the curve. You got to freeze the rent. That's it. Yeah. But what would we how who would how would I get any food in my house? <laughs> no, no, I mean. Like we need you some remember, people. We need some people invoke, to go to work. I want to invoke the memory, uh, that recent memory of of when we had a massive disaster in New York City, which was called Hurricane Sandy, and we created something out of the Occupy Network called Occupy Sandy. I actually made a short film about it. I should put it up on my website. Occupy Sandy um, was the Occupy Network mobilized for a crisis, and Occupy Sandy was delivering food to people and amassing resources to people. 35, I think it was 25,000 volunteers every single day. Now, and, they, and they, they got in their private cars and they drove food out to the Rockways. They went up the stairs in buildings that didn't have uh, electricity because seniors were trapped up in there. And they outperformed FEMA. They outperformed the state. They outperformed New York City. And it was a crucial part of that recovery. And the, and the recovery was sourced from within the communities, right? It wasn't like, you know, disaster capitalism. We could be doing things it's harder it's so much harder now because you can't have a meeting it's like but also like it's a little different with a hurricane than it is with a with a uh, a pandemic because then the still we need to get those masks to the people who are going to deliver to the old, old folks well, yeah of course but this if this were the priority we could get this done yeah if they can build a, a thousands of beds in the jacob javits center as, as the new hospital they can give a mask to somebody working at the key foods or whatever yeah, whole foods kidding. you know you're seeing the cops in spain handing out masks as people going into the subway right it's just our attitude we're going to protect wall street but we're not going to protect the people and it's just it's, it's a it's, it, we can't give these guys a free pass on this you know <laughs> what i mean we can't be like oh i love quiz Chris Cuomo and Andrew Cuomo, like, yeah, I'm Italian also. Like, my mother's 100% Italian, so I have a whole, I love their banter. It I know, me, I have a, I it have reminds that me of when my brother was speaking to me, which, right. because we're Italian, he's not right now. But, like, the truth is, no. you know, like, <laughs> is he it, Republican? It, it was my heart, but it's well, also yeah. like, you know, guys, come on, stand up for the people. I know, I know, I know, I feel that way too. We're off I track, think, though. I'm you sorry. know, I think, uh, it could be good, right? Because people are like, oh, I, I'm I'm moved to like you. Now, what's your politics? And, well, uh, you know, it'd be good instead of like being like, wait, now I have to hate you to be like, actually, how about if I push you? You know, you know what I mean? Well, that's but that's the important thing is that it is uh, it is up to us to organize. All of our major social transitions have happened because people organized and people pushed. They never originated with a politician who was like, I know, I'll serve the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, that was Bernie. Bernie did that. 
But Mario I, I, was pretty good. Yeah. Well, Not you know, pretty good is about as good as we get, right? It's like the And yeah. so in, to make any of these guys actually good, it's our job, unfortunately, as a citizenship to be the democracy and to push them. And that's what the Green New Deal is about, right? So $2 trillion to Wall Street, but we can't pay for something that would save the planet. Okay. Yeah. That's um, what Josh, the Green New Deal is. How do you think that... Um, if we already had a Green New Deal in place, right? If we had been working on this for say five or 10 years yeah. um, and there was a lot going on and then all of a sudden we had a pandemic. I, you know, I feel like some of the things that the Green New Deal is would have put into place would actually mitigate against the wild spreading of this crazy pandemic. Well, um, I think you're right. Um, first of all, you know, in in New York, we actually have a Green New Deal marching forward right now. Um, it started uh, back 10 years ago when we uh, were in the anti-fracking movement and we created a 100% renewable energy plan for the state of New York. Uh, that was a group of people, including myself, Mark Ruffalo, Mark Jacobson, the Stanford scientist, and a whole bunch of other incredible folks. And we pushed that at the governor of New York saying, this is your alternative to fracking. And they actually started down that road towards 100% 100 renew 100 renewable energy in New York. It's a much smaller plan than what the government, the federal would, would be, right? But those people who have solar panels, right, are not susceptible right now to um, a contingency which is now happening all across the United States, right? We had on Monday a terrifying day. All those trees back there that you look so nice were going like this, and they look like they could throw, fall on the house or on the power line, and millions and millions of people. Uh, because we had tornadoes and extreme weather all throughout the country, lost power. Now imagine being a first responder in that situation where you now have a person's house that's demolished and you can't even get six feet with the, from them um, to rescue them. Imagine being a power worker, right, who is a, a, for the utility company, who's now trying to fix a situation of, of, of all these power lines being down and you have a global pandemic happening at the same time. You know how difficult your life is right now just staying at home. Can you imagine having to do work like that in the midst of a global pandemic? Can you imagine if you lost power and you had a, a, a mass two months worth of frozen stuff in your freezer and now you're in the city like, and all your food is frozen, right? All your food is spoiling right now, right. slowly. So, you know, if you can imagine that, now think about this. You have not just one pandemic, maybe you have five advancing across the world. As we know, climate change will create uh, a, a, an influx of global diseases that are advancing north from the tropics like Zika or uh, chikungunya, dengue, uh, malaria. All those diseases are migrating north as the temperature changes. And here we have an epidemic of Lyme disease because we have ticks that have been increased. Oh, yeah, we have that here uh, too. From, from, uh, from climate change. So it, these crises don't like behave and they're like oh well we'll just do climate change now and pandemic in the next month no they compound each other and they complicate each other so we have um unfortunately right now in throughout a huge swath of america climate change and extreme weather and a pandemic overlapping if we don't take uh the green new deal seriously if we don't transition immediately in a u-turn away from fossil fuels we're going to be talking about a future where this is the norm and this is easy compared to what the future looks like. I know the response was incredibly slow. Uh, I don't even know if they've actually done anything the federal government to the federal government, but the the uh, states and the people have turned on a dime within a couple of weeks to address this pandemic. So showing that the country can actually turn on a dime mm -hmm. for something like a pandemic, I think do you think that that is actually helpful? Uh, because I think people need to picture what clean air looks like. And now we have that. We have the opportunity to picture what our cities look I'm, like. And I, we have the opportunity amazing. to like, you know, picture what turning on a dime looks like. It's not too bad. You can do mm -hmm. it. No, I think it's, it's a great uh, lesson. And the question is, are we going to learn those lessons? I mean, you know, we, we tend to learn the wrong lesson, right? When 3000 New Yorkers died in nine 11, um, you know, which, uh, I was there for and witnessed, and I used to work in the Trade Center as a gardener, to be honest, to believe it or not. I used to change the water of the plants at, at several different offices at the World Trade Center. Um, and we learned the wrong lesson. That we is awesome. That, I need a, just a quick moment to process. Well, that's in my book, actually. That, that, that's in um, 
the stories about uh, uh, about uh, my experiences during 9-11 and a lot of different experiences are in my book, The Truth Has Changed, which is my uh, solo performance, which I was touring all over the country. Okay, and I was going to ask you about that, but then I felt like I was a terrible movie. host because I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> we were supposed to be a, making a movie about it right now, and I am making a movie about it. I'm just not making the live performance in front of an audience. I'm actually doing it in a completely different way out here in this in this setting. So I'm, I'm fast at work, making it hard at work by myself, making a movie out here um but but uh wait tell me what the book is called it's called the truth has changed and i'm always so stupid i never grab a copy of it before i sit down oh, well, but um see if I can find the, the image truth has it's changed. out already I, right yeah it's out hold on oh, it's right there might be a copy i was at anyway. uh, i was near the trade centers too on 9 11 so i so hear we learned from 9 11 that what we should do is blow up people all over the world murder a million folks create two decades of war and uh, we'll make taxpayers payers pay for it, and we'll traumatize uh, hundreds of thousands of, of, of uh, American armed forces soldiers. These are the lessons that we learned. And then 20 years later, we're like, oh, you know what? That was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing people learn the wrong lessons from coronavirus. We're seeing people um, like freak the fuck out and demand to go back to work and scream angry racist slogans and wave Confederate flags. Those people got to get challenged and all without masks burning, i noticed all without masks i mean it's like you it's know, like that church it? guy who was like yeah, it's fine you can all come to church and then he dies from you know yeah well it's what is that called the darwin award yeah um the i i don't i don't i don't want to i don't, I don't want to wish evil on people but it no is. but i mean if you're it's like you know there more people right now i think die from selfies than like grizzly bears or something do you know what i mean like they get up on top of a cliff and they're like hey and then they fall off and they die and it's, tar it's so horrible bad. but i mean like this is the state of education in the united states right now this is the reason why we're the epicenter of this epidemic because number one trump is one of those people who just doesn't pay attention and doesn't care about science trump comes out and says oh this is a democratic hoax i'm like yeah right Meanwhile, you have people dying, you have people getting sick. I've had friends get sick. I've had friends die. It's a, it's a miserable, horrible thing to see in incompetence and willful ignorance be the be the lessons of the day. So no, we can't learn that. What we have to learn is that yes, we need a green new deal. We need to see the sky. It's unbelievable what you what you see like the planet rebounding um, I'm seeing blue sky, and I thought I was seeing blue sky last year, but I wasn't. No, I it's so beautiful, the sky. Last year, but I wasn't, you know? The um, sky is intensely beautiful. Can you imagine just doing this to, because it's it's better for us? What I say on my show every night, which is called, yes, Staying Home with Josh Fox, your revolutionary guide to the Green New Deal. Right Stay here on ACT TV. On ACT TV. Yeah. It is um, that the, go the, the fossil fuel industry is a global pandemic. Because the fossil fuel industry kills, people don't know this, the fossil fuel industry kills five to seven million people every year. That's, that's, that's way beyond the body count of the coronavirus right now. Five to seven million people a year are killed by just air pollution alone from the fossil fuel industry. That's, if we transitioned away from that, we did the math <laughs> at Stanford University. Um, uh, it would save us $120 trillion a year. Josh. Do I have that right? Maybe it's $12 trillion. I have to look it up. I'm going to look it up. But seriously, like continuing. So what are we going to do? Like the lesson is not, oh, great, coronavirus is making the environment better. No, the, the lesson is like, what are you going to do? Just turn the death machine back on? Yeah, that when, is oh, the it's all, oh, it's all over. Oh, just... Business as usual, put back on the oil and the coal plants and the big SUVs and all that stuff that was killing us because we've survived the coronavirus now, which was a, like a, a gnat. So let's just start the like fossil fuel death machine back up again. Yeah, that should not be the that hopefully will not be the lesson. I think they're itching to uh, start it up because they're starting to see, you know, the the. People are starting to see a whole new life opportunity. I, yes, I, I feel know. like, you know, That's why they don't scared. really want you to feel that. They don't want you to no, feel like, why am I killing myself at this fucking job every day? Something's wrong with this system. You know, hey, look, mm -hmm. 
I, Josh, uh, just until you said that, I didn't realize what happened to me yesterday. I don't go out very often, but I went outside yesterday and um, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I went for a walk in the park and I walked out and I was like, wow, what is what? And it just occurred to me that like, oh, oh, I live in Brooklyn. There's flowers blooming. Things just started to burst open. So it's like really stunning in general, but it was so bright and so incredibly sparklingly beautiful, even in Brooklyn where there's, you know, it's definitely not like your backyard, uh, that it's the clean air that's allowing the sunshine to come through. That and just the, you know, the, the background levels of uh, pollution in New York City cause a significant and appreciable rise in birth defects and heart disease and lung disease and asthma. I mean, that's across the board. That's kids, that's pregnant women, that's old people. That's but just the beauty. Yeah. Well, as it obscure. turns out, as it turns out, beauty is also good for you. Right? It doesn't kill you like ugliness. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, wow. Well said. Uh, can I just run and grab the book? So yeah, go get the book. Yeah. Uh, you know, he did. He d also did a stage performance of this at the public theater, if I remember correctly. And I think that's where I was getting confused. Remember, if you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching on uh, Twitch, if you have thoughts or questions, I see thoughts going in. Uh, Bonobo, I'm going to read yours and Starry Night. But if you have any questions for Josh, um, you know, type them in there and I'll pass them through. Uh, and also the same with our Facebook audience. So we're talking to Josh Fox. He's a filmmaker, uh, an artist, and fabulous person, as you can see. He is a, an activist, I'd say. It's, it's an important part of the uh, important part of the bio. He I'm back. Hi, uh, the Oscar-nominated Emmy-winning 2010 documentary Gaslight. Hi, Josh. Oh, there's the book. All right. Now, this is why I was confused, because didn't you do this at the public theater like you had? I a did. I did. Uh -huh. yeah. So this book is the basis of um, this solo performance that uh, I started back you know, 2018. It was originally a commission from HBO. Um, and then HBO got bought by AT&T. <laughs> and um, is that what happened to HBO? Yeah. Well, you remember the merger of CNN and Time Warner and AT&T? Well, HBO's yeah. in that deal, right? So HBO um, went through a period of time where there was a tr transition of leadership, let's say. Um, and Sheila Nevins, who commissioned this, who was the genius who ran HBO documentaries for 30 years, uh, was fired, um, which was an amazing travesty. And there was a moment where nobody knew what was actually going to happen. Um, and so she had commissioned me to do this, um, uh, this solo performance, and uh, she wanted to do it at the public theater, and um, I, I completed the assignment. Um, but then, uh, so uh, I made the, I'm making the film on my own now. Um, I'm doing another project with HBO. HBO is back. HBO Documentaries is uh, under the um, under some great leadership right now of Nancy Abraham, um, who I who I've known also for years. But uh, so I'm making another film on climate change for HBO. Um, but that's not for a while because obviously I can't go make the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but this one, the truth has changed. We're shooting this month, next month um, in a new way. And uh, hopefully we're going to get it out as a film before the election. So uh -huh. that's, the, that's the hope. And this is about how smear and misinformation campaigns are now the rule in our media, especially in our social media. Um, because the, the people who attacked me for years and years at the fossil fuel industry, um, namely ExxonMobil, Steve Bannon, and those characters, kind of then took over the government. Um, and their techniques and their tactics of smear and misinformation online are a hallmark of the way that Donald Trump campaigns. So it's, my, it's like the oil and gas industry attacking me for years and years and putting me through the ringer and causing an, an immense psychological strain. That's exactly what they do to the electorate. Um, they torture people. They torture you through misinformation. They torture you through fear tactics, propaganda, um, all that. So the, this is go, goes into that. Um, and Get a lot the of that book starts. immediately. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm I don't like, do can a lot I reach of this Zoom screen and get, grab it. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, there, you can order it. Because on, order it on my website, joshfoxfilm.com, and I think on. 
we have the truth has changed tour.com which is ironic because we're no longer touring but the truth has changed as a solo performance um i've toured it uh to i think 40 states and it had a major run at the public Josh, theater yeah, right. from your from your understanding and your um research how what's the best way uh what is the best way for people to that you would suggest for people to parse out the media it's not exactly like we can trust what's coming yeah. from mainstream even if it's not on fox i mean yesterday my husband you know he sent me something from the new york times saying look all of this uh propaganda from the russians uh it's disinformation about our health has been happening but at the same time all of the things that they said in that article were totally like pro, pro big pharma and whatever big pharma says yep. is a good idea so and that's yep. the new york times we know they lied us into a war we know they yep. but where do you go how do you how do you well parse? i think you have to um there's a great book that i read a long long time ago called unreliable sources by a, an outfit called fair fairness and accuracy oh, yeah. in me um and uh or fairness and accuracy in reporting to be a a, a, a consumer of news media, you almost have to be a journalist yourself, right? Um, journalism is fact checking, it's authentic authentication, it's truth seeking. You have to um, get multiple sources of information and you have to be that steadfast about it. Um, because right now, I think propaganda and misinformation is more prevalent in our media than fact and truth is. Because you, you, you have a, a number of different competing interests that have taken over the media. So you have to go to trusted sources and you have to also listen to, you have to develop the habit of like finding great journalists that you love to listen to, right? That you love to, to, to watch. Like Greg Pallast, who's gonna be on my show tonight. He's an incredible journalist on the elections, on how democracy works. Like I trust him on what he's saying there, right? Alexander Zaitchik, who writes a lot for uh, the Atlantic or Rolling Stone. He's an amazing reporter on fossil fuels and on, on politics. Jeff Goodell at um, Rolling Stone, who I'm gonna have next week on the show, just wrote an incredible piece for Rolling Stone about um, uh, 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 Trump and the coronavirus. Naomi Klein is doing incredible work as a journalist. So I think you have to find the people who you trust. Amy Goodman, every single day on Democracy Now, you can't beat her. She's, she's coming out with that incredible story every single day. Um, I'm just waiting for her to like go to an hour 20 or an hour 15 because well, she has to squeeze it all into the hours. You know, Amy, I mean, I've, I used to, I, you know, I did, I've done Democracy Now quite a bit. I've done a lot of things with Amy Goodman over the years. She, man, she's tough as nails. She is like, she gets in there and you, you, you know, she, she, she's no um, artifice. No, no, there's nothing glam about that. She gets in there and she tells you the truth and it's painful a lot. It's really hard sometimes, but um, I so deeply appreciate what Amy Goodman does at Democracy Now. So, you know, um, and they have a huge newsroom there, right? They're actually doing the news, right? They're doing the research. So, um, Oh yeah, no, they're doing the news, the way the news, I mean, I'm a to, you have professor of media studies, that's the way that you're supposed to do it. You have to question what comes yeah. across your screen. You have to, um, because it's designed to make you stop and tune in, you know, it's, they're called, it's called thumb stopping, <gasps> right? Um, but it's not necessarily designed to be true. <laughs> Josh, where... Uh, so thank you for all the suggestions for people who are watching where they can go for media. Um, where how, where are we in terms of the Green New Deal now that Bernie is, I mean, it's possible he could still win, but he's not, you know, going to be the president likely. Right. Well, I, I think safe. for so many of us. And what just, can progressives do yeah. given the current political situation? Um, we're having some, I'm, I'm having a hard time. You're, you're <laughs> People in our chat are saying, Amy Gooden is no Chris Cuomo, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, uh, I'm having a hard time you breaking up a little bit. I, I wonder, oh, no. Um, maybe there's, uh, uh, it, it, it's okay. I just want There's all sure kinds of art. Am I coming through okay? Because it's, it's. Uh, there's all kinds of crazy. Yeah, you're coming through. I can okay, see fine. that I'm frozen a little bit and I'm um, not yeah. So wh wh where are we with the Green New Deal now that Bernie's not a presidential candidate anymore? Well, we're at this very specific part of the process where we don't really have the nominee 
coronated yet, as it were, or right. Um, and we still have Bernie in on the ballot. So I think, first of all, you got to vote for Bernie anyway, right? Which is what I'm going to be doing. Um, and that is to ensure that there are a lot of delegates going forward into the, the platform committee, right? Where, because between the actual, between now and the convention, they write the Democratic platform. So if you have Bernie uh, get a lot of delegates, there are, is a good chance that a lot of Bernie people can help write significant parts of that platform. In other words, me. I was on the platform committee in 2016. I helped write the Democratic platform and we were in there duking it out, right? The Clinton people were pro-fracking and they had fracking lobbyists as their environmental people. And on the other side, you had me and Bill McKibben and Russell Green and great environmentalists who were like, okay, so we came, we hammered it out and we made a lot of progress. And I don't think, you know, Joe Biden is not a Green New Deal candidate, but what we can do is get in there and insert big chunks of the Green New Deal into the platform. And that can be very effective because then when he gets elected, hopefully, we go and say, look at this, look at this, look, it's in the platform. You've got to do this. And then we can use that as leverage because we have gained an enormous amount of power, right, in the last five years. We, as progressive, as these movements united together, the climate movement, the LGBTQI movement, the anti-fracking movement, the anti-war movement, the fight for 15, Occupy, all the movements that have come to unify behind the Bernie Sanders candidacy, or not to say behind, but with the Bernie Sanders candidacy, um, that's not me, us, we have the huge amount of power right now. And that power is something we should exercise at this moment. So it's not the, the moment to go like, hey, yay, Joe Biden, everything's fine now. No, the moment is now, if you want a vote, you got to work with us. And it's got to be significant because it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what Bernie says. It matters what the Biden campaign says and what positions we actually believe they're going to help, right? If Biden comes forward and says, well, you know what? I've looked at the Green New Deal. We don't want any new fracking. We want to move forward with these trillion dollar initiatives in renewable energy. You know, that would be really significant. And we have the p power to do that now. We have the power to move them. Biden is going to have to tack left to get us. Uh oh, now I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, hold on. I think we're good. Oh, okay. Okay, so some of the people, some of the, uh, one of the say pod, some there's people out there who are like, I'm not gonna vote for Biden because the DNC fucked us around Bernie the last two elections, and we've got people who are, you know, thought setters uh, like the folks over at the great podcast Ch Chapo Trap House tweeting out like they're not gonna vote for Biden. Um, what would you say in that case? I would say they're not just shooting themselves in the foot, they're shooting themselves in the head. The, the bottom and line those is two. If, you, if you don't, and up to, if you don't, um, if you don't participate, if you say, I'm not gonna participate, it's like a temper tantrum, right? This is performance, you know? When, when, um, when you say, well, it's me, I'm not gonna do this. Well, who cares about you? It's like, it's like the same thing as that guy who's like, well, I am an environmentalist, I have a solar roof and I have a Tesla. Yeah, it's because you're a rich guy, right? You, as a single person, don't matter. Like, what matters is what we organize to accomplish, right? So if we were saying, as an organized block of voters, we're not going to vote for Joe Biden unless A, B, C, and D, right? Unless Green New Deal, marijuana legalization, uh, $15 an hour minimum wage, and Medicare for all. If we went in that there- That sounds we said, good. Can we right, do that? If we said, as a group of people, we're going to organize and withhold um, until you say you're going to do these things. And then we would probably get some of them. We wouldn't get them all, right? But that's the process of democracy, right? That's the process of engaging and participating in, in democracy, right? So if, if we were to say, okay, um, we're, what we have to do now is organize, and I wish Bernie would say this, or at least- I Bernie. know, because Bernie's like in a good position to say like- Well, uh, that's I think what Bernie is actually doing. What Bernie is actually doing is saying, vote for me in the primaries, and then we're gonna go negotiate at the platform hearings, and that's what I'm saying to you right now, right? Yeah. So, but if you're gonna just say, me, 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 I don't wanna do this, right? You know, then you're just encouraging people to have no power. You're encouraging people to give the power away 
that we've spent so much time creating, right? We have spent so much time. I mean, even building in the chat, this power. Got Why would you just be like, well, we didn't get 100% of it, so I'm going to throw it all away? That's just ludicrous. I understand. We have people people are, in the chat saying things that. like, Coma Joe is a super hard sell. And I feel yeah, like, that's but true. you're not buying Coma Joe. Right. That's not, it's not like about one guy. It's still not me, us. Right. You know, it's, it's not Coma Joe, it's us. And I think Coma Joe would be easier to push to the left than Trump. Let's also be honest. No well, question. The, the, the answer is, if these people are so like protesty and they're like, I'm going to protest with my vote. No, 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 no. You ask yourself the question, who would you rather protest? Would you rather protest Joe Biden or would you rather protest Donald Trump? We have seen that we are going to be living in a protest lifestyle, right? We are going to have to participate. We're going to have to be protesters. We're going to have to be activists. That's not going to change. But who would your target rather be? right? Joe Biden, who you can actually accomplish some things with, right? Or Donald Trump. I mean, and I think it's very satisfying because I think the truth, like truly, I, or, or Governor Cuomo, like the truly, truly problem is that I think what's motivating a lot of that is just sheer exhaustion. People are exhausted. People are exhausted because their life is rough and people are exhausted because they've spent so much time campaigning and they're like heartbroken. And when you're heartbroken, the first thing you, you want to do is just hang up the phone and never talk to anybody ever again. And if, you know, if, and if you yeah. get your heart broken, you're like, I don't want to speak to that person ever again. Well, the truth of the matter is though, like you have to speak to them. If you have children, you have to speak to them. If you have to work out something that you're mutually ob obligated with that person. Right. So the, the truth of the matter is that our children are our policies, right? Our, our, our world is dependent on us going back into that arena, even though we've been bruised, even though we've been hurt, even though we've been, beaten up we have to go back into the arena we can't just say oh well i'm never going to do this again i'm not I, re I refuse to examine my own flaws i refuse to examine this relationship no the truth of the matter is we have to go back in we have to be strong and we have to win we can't just say all right i'm going to lose willfully lose no we can't do that we have to be strong we have to win <clears throat> because otherwise there's no earth <laughs> there's no planet. Otherwise, we have five competing. Yeah, there's no global, right. We have five competing global pandemics at the same time as the sea levels are rising, and we have constant ex uh, extreme weather. That's the future. We don't win. Josh, we have questions coming in for you from the chat, which I want to uh, hand over to you. That sounds great. I want to make sure and that I want to five more this. minutes because we have Josh Holland from the. That's fine. I, but I want to fix this internet problem because I can't see you. Hey, Juliana. Yeah. Um, so Rebecca just gave us. Sorry, a here I am. I'm back. I'll wait till after this. Hi, Hold on sorry. a second, Josh. I I just my Zoom just crashed and now I'm back. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, Go I had to run out of the room to just um, uh, disable a different another computer, which I think was. High I didn't even notice. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, good. Um, let's ask some of the questions in the Twitch and hopefully our technology will hold out as we continue here. Um, and we only have a couple more minutes because Josh Holland is going to come on from the nation and people who are really tired uh, about why it's important to keep on keeping on here. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, uh, the question, here it is. From uh, Iron Maj, how do you deal with people that don't believe in harm reduction slash think Biden will be followed by an even bigger fascist than Trump? Well, I think the, the truth is that um, the Obama presidency with its economic inequality, with its fracking, with its very poor environmental policies, with its wars, um, left a lot of people extremely dissatisfied. Um, and that that was one of the things that pushed us into Donald Trump. I think also a lot of people really, really didn't like Hillary Clinton because of her history and because of, um, you know, her wars and, and her conduct and her pro fracking attitudes. And I think a lot of those things existed at the margins to such degree that it uh, helped Donald Trump get elected. There's no question. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like I was saying in, in the earlier question was like, you know, we have the power. <laughs> 
we have to understand we have the power. Um, they don't have the power. We have built power. We are in the middle of the most power I've ever seen progressives have in the United States. Um, that's extraordinary. And, you know, you got to understand that, like, I don't believe the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King would have achieved what it was able to achieve if you didn't have LBJ in the White House, if you didn't have Johnson, a Democrat in the White House. Let's say you had Donald Trump in the White House or Barry Goldwater or Richard Nixon, right? Like during that peak moment of the civil rights movement, it would have been a very, very different history. Everybody understands that. It would have taken a lot longer for Martin Luther King to achieve and the civil rights movement to achieve what they did achieve, okay? So when we have Republicans in office, we're on defense. We're on defense, always. We're defending against their crazy ass wars. We're defending against their crazy ass fossil fuel policies. We're defending against their hijack of the, of the financial market so that they can make lots and lots of money. We're defending against Nazis in the streets. When the Democrats are in office, as horrible as they are, um, we go on offense. And we campaign for the things that we want. And it's just, it, I hate to use that analogy, but it's kind of like football. It's like, if you don't have the ball, you can't score. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, unless you intercept. But, but it's besides a great point, analogy. It's a terrible analogy. <laughs> but what, because it's, you know, you're bashing well, your head exact, against. But it's still it is, it does, politics does feel like football. You're constantly hitting your head against things. It hurts a lot. Huh. But, you know, like, but the truth of the matter is that we have to go on offense. And if we were have a Joe Biden in office, we have a group of policies that are similar to what, um, in principle, at least what we want. We get to go on offense and we get to push them. So I think, you know, um, we didn't see that be the case in the first Obama administration. Obama won two terms. Um, we were able to continue to push and go on offense. Um, and, you know, look, I, I, I want I'm, I still want Bernie Sanders to be president. I'm a Bernie Sanders surrogate officially for the campaign. <laughs> you know? um, uh, the campaign doesn't exist anymore, which is really sad. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, no, I think there's we, kind we of have an interesting, the power. I think there's an interesting position. If we were, again, as you said, in terms of office and, and defense, if Bernie Sanders became the president, we would still have to be defending, defending, defending. And well, if we Biden would, gets the yeah. presidency, we get to offend and push and push and push in a different kind of way, um, which I think might actually, I don't want to say like, but there's an opportunity to be even more successful than if we, if we had Bernie in and we had to constantly be defending the uh, attacks. Exactly. You yeah. know, it's a possibility that this could actually work out in the progressives' favor. Either way, that exhaustion that says, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, you got to listen to that and you got to pay attention to that because you got to renew yourself and you have to take care of yourself. But either way, that bitterness shouldn't be the rule. The rule should be look at all that we've achieved. Look at all that we've achieved. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary success. That's what Noam Chomsky was saying. And if, you dis if you're bucking with Grandfather Gnome, you got problems, right? It's right. a remarkable <laughs> success. Are you getting Gnome stuff. on your show? I would love to. I should have to do that. Get that. Yeah. So um, tonight I you're think... having um, you're having uh, Greg Palace. You and I should talk to each other since we have shows on the same network and we have the same guest lineup. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. at least well, not Greg have is coming a lot out with of a book. every morning and night. That's being... Greg is coming out with a book. Um, and so he's got a book coming out called uh, How Trump Stole 2020, mm. which I think is <laughs> it's great. Because he's trying to get it. It's actually a companion piece to my book, I think, because he's talking about actual voter suppression and I'm talking about psychological voter suppression. And they're both really a factor in all of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love Greg and his work has influenced me for many, many years. Um, I, I, I mused that we should have a, a podcast with him and me and Bernie Sanders called Three Jews, Two Hats. Um, and and I'm, nice. I'm, ho I'm hoping that that's another incarnation of a program on, on Act TV. I think Act TV would love it. <laughs> yeah. We could get Bernie to come around. Um, and we could have Cardi B, Cardi B on there, too. Um, and, and, and then it would be, uh, uh, I don't know what Is she Jewish? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, I think we'd accept her. We can, yeah. we, we can work on it. I pass physically, but not... <laughs> I think Cardi B as a Jew would be interesting. Um, I bet you she could do something with the uh, yarmulkes and whatever. 
You know, I know we asked you to be on. This happens a lot when we have fascinating guests. Uh, we ask people to come on for like 20, 25 minutes to talk about one topic. And then we get, then we, we wind up having these great conversations that last like twice as long. So I do want to thank you so much for being on with us for this amount of time. And I hope you'll come back. You know, again, we're working on the same thing, which is amazing. And uh, everyone in the chat seems to be thrilled. Let me check. Let me scan for the last of the questions and comments sure. here. Um, well, there's a lot. You're going to, you're going to have to come back on the Twitter. To. Everybody. Um, it's good. It helps. It, you know, it's like I, I do a show in the evening. So, you know, 10 a.m. is early for me. Um, yeah, so it's, I know. It's helpful. It's helpful. I watch your show in the evening and then I have to. I okay. made the mistake, Josh, of uh, leaving my earphones in on YouTube after watching, uh, I don't know, something about Chris Hedges, who was just on our show earlier this week. Uh -huh. And um, I just had nightmares he was talking about what might happen in 2030 i just had yeah. literally nightmares all night i couldn't shake it so chris your show is, is way better <laughs> i'm just saying chris it's, is awesome his his book war is a force that gives us meaning is one of my one of my favorite uh books and chris you know chris is dark and chris can be really intense to take and i really appreciate what he does because he's got that he, he, he sees that he was a war reporter so he yeah. saw he saw people get blown up over and over and over again because um, of these policies. And we, we share, uh, you know, a mutual friend, um, Tim Hetherington, who, who died in Hillary's war in Libya as a reporter. Uh, one minute we were at the Oscars together, Chris, uh, because he was nominated for Restrepo, the great uh, uh, Afghanistan documentary, and, and myself for Gasland. And the second to last thing he ever tweeted out was us at the Oscars. And then, oh, oh, this doesn't look good. And then he was killed in Libya Awful. in a war that didn't need to happen mm -hmm. um, because of Hillary Clinton. And Chris Hedges' uh, opinions are influenced by his uh, incredible depth of understanding of the of human misery of war. And, and that is what I'm trying to say about offense and defense. You know, the Republicans invent wars. Uh, the Obama administration also invented wars, but we still have to understand that we have the power in this situation and we have to use that power and negotiate. We've been speaking with Josh Fox, American film director, playwright, environmental activist, best known for your Oscar nominated Emmy winning 2010 documentary Gasland, but also uh, for the new book that we've been talking about. The truth has changed. Get it, read it. Josh is on ACT TV almost every single night. What time does the show Monday start now? Monday through Friday from seven to eight, unless Bernie comes on. Unless Bernie we, comes on. We move back an hour and a half. So last yeah. night we were actually on at 830 because Bernie came on at seven. Um, it's because called Staying our, Home with Josh Fox and you can find it on ACT TV and you can also find it on Josh's, um, you know, all of Josh's platforms. So don't forget to follow him if you're not already. It's at on Twitter at Josh Fox Film. Josh, thanks a lot for coming on. I'm going to have Alana reach out to you and. We'll okay. do this again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. It. Have a great morning. Thanks. You too. Okay.